Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm James Rink, and uh, you are listening to Super Soldier Talk. And uh, today we actually are going to bring on two super soldiers to share their story, rather our story, because I'm one, and so is Apollo Me Mandelian, who is uh, very gracious to join us here tonight, and as well as all the listeners here in the chat. Thank you also for joining us. And um, uh, so there's some great questions in the chat. Well, I'm going to try to get to, to answer some of your questions. But um, let me go ahead and introduce Apollo Me by reading her bio, and then we'll we'll, uh, we'll cue her to uh, share some more information that she would like to share. So Apollo Me Mandelian is a super soldier hybrid mix of dragon and plagiarian or Pladian DNA created by Dark Fleet and the ICC, which stands for the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate. She has been recruited into Project Mind Control, Project MK Ultra, Project Crest, aka Stargate, Project Carbon, and then underwent a My Lab, which she uh, took her to Section 13, uh, 32C at Area 52, located near Area 51. From there, she was sent into the book boot camp at Camp Livingston in Louisiana, where she was trained by NAZI's Air Aryans. <laughs> that is known as Project Ashwet, Children of God, to make the most supreme super soldiers in the universe, according to them anyway. From there, she resumed her training at Section 1332C to make her, ba her battle ready for military combat and psionic missions. The treatment she and others like her received was atrocious. She recalls being forced to eat gruel, and she had to wear discipl disciplinary shock collars. One day she was raped and then she lost it and rebelled by killing three of her uh, military superiors that were in upper management. Normally when something like that would take place, they would scrap a rebellious soldier. However, because she's a super soldier and they spent millions on her, they decided it was best to send her to the draconian Mars base as punishment to help her understand how good she had it at section 1332 C. So, Apollo, and uh, we we've actually we've discussed this in pre pre a previous show. This is like I said, this um this is the third interview she's done. So you're gonna have to go back and listen to some of the other other interview if you want to listen about that because we're we're gonna share a different mission here today. But uh, continuing on here, Apollo me also remembers training in Inner Earth with some blonde haired, blue eyed people, and she also participated in Project Blue Book which helped the military understand various ET technologies and missions, both dimensional and off world. Um, so yeah, we're going to go into this Draco battle today, which took place on 3.5 Delta quadrant on a moon near Sirius. And we don't, I don't know which Sirius it is, but um, Apollo me will be sharing some of their latest missions as well as answering some of the Q and a from audience members questions. And I've included a link to some of her websites if you want to reach out and contact her. So thank you, Apollo me for coming on here. Thank you for How having you? me. <laughs> it's doing okay. <laughs> great, great. All right. So um, yeah, well, um, is there anything else you'd like to add to that bio that I might have missed? Uh, no, that'll be fine for now. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So we've actually done some work together to try to um, determine some, uh, missions that you have been on. And, um, it, it's, even though you were in section 13, uh, 32 C and I was over at Kruger, uh, they sometimes will loan us out and there was an actual particular point in time where our paths crossed off out there. So today what we're going to do is we're going to present some information that, uh, Apollo me has, um, recalled, uh, through, I guess you could say regression or a meditation, um, um, experience that helped you, uh, to see some of this information. So, uh, yes, yesterday we, we spent probably about <laughs> a couple hours putting all this together. So I guess, uh, it's been agreed that I'm going to be the one narrating this. However, these are actually Apollonie's words. So for people out there who want to put comments in the chat that I'm not letting her speak. I actually am letting her speak. This is all her words. So um, with m m um, my editorial um, skills. So without further ado, and by the way, I will allow Apollo me to comment <laughs> once, we're, once we get through this uh, 
as we get through it. Okay, so Apollony now is on a planet with soil that is tannish red color. There is no flora or fauna here. It is all rock and barren. Uh, she's able to determine that her name is Epsilon Queen, and she's approximately four foot six inches tall and wearing a black uniform. That is her original body. She is in some kind of alien hybrid body that looks like it has elf ears, crimson red hair, and green eyes. Her name was given to her by, the, I guess, her scientist handler and rated by abilities or specialities. There are also four people in front of her, two standing and two are sitting down on a rock. They are from different factions of her group. She is an original female hybrid body. Some of the other people are hybrids and some are humans. She thinks, uh, okay, I got that. Yeah, she, well, the comma was Epsilon. She thinks her name is Epsilon Queen. Okay, so um, I think the person, Star Shooter, is, is he standing? So he's in front of you? He is off to the left side of me. Okay, Star Shooter is a human hybrid male. Uh, he's probably around 6'5". And I'm going to get some more information about Star Shooter just a bit. But the person next to Star Shooter is not human. Uh, the skin color is tan. Um, he is taller too, about 6'8". There's also an insectoid type human sitting down. He has green skin, light, which is light green skin, and he's very cybernetic. And then I'm there, um, six foot two, brown hair, short hair, fade. Uh, they call me Sabretooth, and also is very cybernetic. Um, so that's where, you know, if you look at the uh, picture, the video, um, left eye, um, heat seeking, right eye, normal. All of us are wearing the same skin type uniform from head to toe with white boots. It, uh, the uniform looks white with blue with no text or insignia designs. Everyone has a helmet on except Sabretooth and the Mantis. Apparently, those two individuals didn't need breathing apparatus because of the cybernetics. The mission was to be the backup for the mission because they were, it says here, getting attacked by other ET factions in the area. They accepted groups assistance for stronger firepower. Can you please, uh, Apollo, can you explain what, what was going on with that? So the faction that Sabretooth ended up working for ended up hiring Section 13 members for stronger backup. Okay, and um, do you have any information why these Draco were wanted to invade this world? Mm -mm. No, they don't give us that information. They just give us uh, our objective and end up sending up end up sending us on our way. <laughs> okay. Well, let's just assume there was some kind of research facility or colony outpost there. How come the locals didn't take up arms and try to fight the Draco themselves? Why do they need to send five, six super soldiers out there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't they have their own security for? Okay. <laughs> if they don't tell us anything. They literally give us our objective and we don't even know where we're going half of the time. So... All right, so from there, we move to the rendezvous point, uh, which is some kind of field area and taking station. Um, so I'm assuming this is all some kind of desert planet, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very barren. There's no floral fauna animals that we saw in okay. the area. Um, it doesn't take very long for the draconian ships to show up. The fighting starts. They start touching ground, and then Sabretooth ended up firing uh and we got into better positions into enemy lines we end up flanking them both on both sides of a team of six people now because another scout showed up and uh, as a small group we were able to factually fight the draconians and were victorious however star shooter uh he's the human hybrid male, about six five he was injured on on his leg by the draconians do you remember what specifically injured a what do they do they bite them or something <laughs> what happened i'm not entirely sure i was fighting elsewhere we just when we started running away from the ships um i just noticed that his leg was injured and two of the members were carrying him out like on their shoulders okay uh so let's see here uh there were five five ships touched down we're not sure how many draconians came out to battle uh 
But okay, so Sabretooth ending up taking up most of the small henchmen, reptilians, while Polymy focused on eliminating the draconians using her psionic abilities. She can create some kind of nuclear explosion. And then afterward, the team, well, I guess that the team had to safely evacuate the area before that explosion took place. Okay. So after that happened, none, no one was left. The Draco ships were blown up, and we also jammed their signals to prevent calls for backup. Okay, so at this point, well, do you want to comment about anything else about any of this? Um, so when when I first met the entire team, they were we were just kind of off on one of the areas. We actually had to move from that area further away in order uh, when we saw the ships coming down and that's when the battle started so i ended up going with one of the other members and we ended up kind of flanking them and then Sabretooth ended up opening fire when some of the um draconians lackeys basically started coming out of the ships and we just ended up in this huge like firefight basically i ended up fighting at least two of the draconians, uh, mostly on my own. And then the team that Sabretooth was on uh, ended up fighting kind of elsewhere. I usually take my battles kind of off to the side just because I can be a little destructive. <laughs> uh, there's very few party members that I usually get assigned with who can uh, basically battle with me. But and then we ended up subduing those guys, getting onto their ships, jamming their codes, and then you guys, I told you guys to run, and then I ended up doing my, my most devastating ability, which is literally creating a nuclear explosion. Uh, if you guys want the physics of that, I basically create an energy ball to the point where it creates a gravitational flow and then just collapse it. <laughs> so... Uh, do you know how big the blast radius was? Um, big enough to take out five ships. So I can really tell you. I mean, the ships were pretty decent sized. We, I mean, each of them had at least twenty people coming out of it. Hmm. Uh, so I guess the moral of the story is we shouldn't try to get you upset. <laughs> you know, do you ever have a carry moment? Like the, I don't know, Stevie. Have you ever seen Stevie King movie Carry? But, uh -huh. um, Nothing, nothing like that has happened to you in your civilian life? Uh, I've had some pretty interesting things happen to me in my civilian life. I, I've had my eyes turn crimson red. I've uh, had things move towards me. Uh, I've had I've scared a lot of people. I've made people tell the truth. <laughs> so, yeah, it's I do have abilities. It's just with my augmentation, it blocks a lot of it out. Uh, I, I have also phased through objects physically in my civilian life as well, and more than just the door when I was four and a half years old. I do have some friends that I like to spar with, and I've actually phased through them before. And they said it was very cold and the most bone-chilling thing they've ever experienced. Hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, well... I mean, we could go, we could discuss more of these abilities or, or we could just continue on here at the presentation. W which direction would you like to take this? Oh, we can continue on at the presentation. I don't want to derail too much. Sure. All right. So now we go into some conversation. Uh, so we are able to pick up some, um, inf yeah. Okay. So this message is from Sabretooth uh, to uh, me. He referred to me as James 2.52. You need to unlock yourself. The memories will be painful. Once you survive that, you can get strong to come find me. Sabretooth will show you the rest of the way. Uh, so question is, how come, I guess, we as general, as super soldiers, or uh, us in the SSP have trouble remembering these memories? And the answer is from Sabretooth, James 2.52, you are a clone of me. You will get residual memories because of the consciousness link. So our alters, so basically these memories are being conducted in other clone bodies off world. So technically it's almost like uh, almost like a dream, um, an astral. So sometimes you, when you wake up, you don't necessarily remember all your dream, but if it's being done in another realm, it may, this, the rate of time may not be the same as well as the memories are, are located in another physical vessel. Is that 
Is that probably a good way to look at it? The reason why the memories don't bleed through? So if you really kind of want to think about it, it's, and I started to realize that I started having these in, um, uh, when I went to my boot camp in Camp Livingston, most people would consider this what they call the avatar program, where they put an augment in your brain, and then you are controlling a body, usually a clone of yourself, uh, out in space or somewhere else. And the the feedback is almost like Wi-Fi. You feel everything, and you can control your other body almost completely. And sometimes they put you in your clone. Sometimes they put you in other species bodies. And it, that takes a while to get used to and control because you have to like analyze everything of that, their abilities and bodily functions. Um, but I guess that would be like the best example that people can relate to. I finally watched the show. <laughs> finally. <laughs> and someone had to sit me down and make me watch it. It was, it was an okay show. But there was a lot of disclosure in there that I was actually surprised on, but the neuro linking system for the avatars uh, for controlling a body elsewhere uh, and the memory share is kind of the same, but they don't put you in tube chambers. It's literally like an augment that's like this big. So it's a lot more advanced, I guess, but sometimes all the memory will transfer over, sometimes not. And it also depends if they were going to wipe your memories or suppress your memories after your mission. Okay. Um, later on, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to read a little bit from my book later on, but let's, mm -hmm. let's continue going on because uh, about this. Okay. So our question, are, are alters out there aware of us in the here and now? And the answer is yes. Um, cause they're usually more psionic than, I mean, they would want us to be down here. Okay. Next question. Where is this location? And it's 3.5 Delta quadrant moon near Sirius. And, uh, so, uh, more about the conflict. The draconians are pushing this fleet to, to make this way to take territory. Uh, we were successful. Um, I tried to find out in what information uh, the super soldiers were working for, and we just are getting silence, turning of head and quiet from the group. Why? Do you, maybe it's because they didn't know or they, they weren't even told? It sounded like they just didn't really want to disclose any of that information. All right. Uh, so we ask, uh, do you have any family or children out there? Uh, the answer is no. I'm not sure who that question was. <laughs> was that? But anyway, um, question. Oh, oh, I guess that was for me. For but for Ptolemy, family or children, you got there. You have a Absalom Queen out there, and that mission was only nine years old. Mm -hmm. They put her in a chamber to age us to age her to 13 years old, and then put into service. Is that correct? Am I getting? Yes. That? And then they would age regress us back. Uh, do you actually remember the technology that they used to age regress you? They ended up putting us in these weird chambers. So that's that's and all that I really know. <laughs> was the process painful? Uh, it kind of burned a little bit. I mean, other than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go on here. Uh, some more information about Sabretooth. He's 45 years old, but he looks like he's 20. He has cybernetics, left eye heat seeking, visual schematics, reads locational coordinates, left arm is cybernetic. He got his <laughs> pieces, but sterile. He's muscular, but athletic build, no tattoos, weapons, pistol, plasma blaster by side and a bowing knife. Boots are blue. Helmet has a HUD display. Saber two psionic abilities include telepathy, psychokinesis, amongst others. More information about Epsilon Queen. Well, actually, let me pause. Do you do you want to add anything else to that? Oh, are you still there? Actually, am I still here? Am I am I still on here? Yeah. There you go. You froze up. Okay, now you're. Sorry about that. My internet decided to just kick off for some reason. <laughs> uh did you hear what what I what I said? All 
I heard was a description about a Bowie knife. <laughs> <laughs> a Bowie knife. Let me go back here. A Bowie knife. Boots are blue. Helmet has HUD display and, and saber tooth psionic abilities include telep telepathy, psychokinesis, amongst others. Anything else you want to add to that? Uh, no, that's about it. Okay. Excellent queen. She is carrying blades and a blaster, but she mostly uses her psionic abilities. For example, she can create a nuclear blast. She also has a black sniper rifle, which she rarely uses. Anything else you want to add? No. Okay. I mean, most of our Section 13 uh, outfits are usually black, like all of our suits and everything. All right. The insectoid has the ability of telepathy and mind control. And also being able to sense people's movements. Starshooter is one of the top combat um, experts in firearms. He has precognitive abilities. He is also a private person and does not was not very cooperative in this project. <laughs> so <laughs> he didn't want to talk to me like a, at all very much. <laughs> okay. He's good on the battlefield though. So uh so message from Epsilon Queen, uh, that's your altar there, Apollo me. So um, the message is, I don't enjoy hurting people, but this is the only time I get to be my true self in my true form. We don't belong in society, and we are also treated like crap. Uh, the head staff take pleasure in torturing us and keep us training all the time to keep us battle ready. Um, so as far as trying to recover your memories from this altar, uh, was not cooperative. The answer is, um, at this point, um, you can just access, I guess we can access the Akashic record is what message we got for that. Um, okay. Well, that's basically it. Then you go back into your body. So, um, anything else you'd like to add about this particular experience? The, re the regression or the mission? <laughs> Either or, whatever you want to add. I mean, like, who's this James 2.52? Who's that? It's supposed to be you. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, why? The, wait, so, tip, okay, wait a minute. Typically, clones are not given names. They're given numbers. So what? how how do you assume? I mean, I, I remember having a childhood. Why do you assume I'm a clone? <laughs> Where's that? Well, even clones have childhoods. I mean, I'm I'm starting to figure out that I've had several clones throughout my entire birth and existence down here. So, which is definitely not what I was expecting at all. Like, I wasn't expecting to find any of this information on myself at all. Um, you know, so... And they have my original body apparently out in space that they keep all the time so that they can keep making clones of me like, and putting me down here. But that answer was literally what uh, Sabretooth had, get, had given me during the regression um, to, to give to you. So I don't really know his train of thought or the full knowledge that he had on that. All right. Okay. Well, uh, should I go ahead and just pull up some questions from the – the audience members, if you like. Um, yeah, we can do that. And then there is another mission that I have that I could go into as well, if you if you want. All right. Um, let's see here. So I'm looking for questions relevant to what we were just discussing. I know there's a lot, a lot of good questions in the chat, and there happen to be a few that are not so good. But um, <laughs> how long does it take? How long does age regression take in Earth time? From Francine, what do you think? How long does age regression take from? Mm, I'm not entirely sure because when you go through the process, it is definitely disorienting. I mean, because like you're literally basically aging your entire body. And I'm not entirely sure on the full technology of that. I don't know if they're just messing with your quantum field, <laughs> which literally kind of stops your brain process in the time. Um, I don't, I remember some of the pain, the burning sensation. And then after that, I just kind of black out all the time. So it took me a while to realize that they were 
like back then, this is in the 80s, okay, and in, in the early 90s, back then they did not have, Section 13 did not have the technology that they do now. Uh, it's really advanced within the last couple, let's say 20, not 20 years, but like the last seven, seven years at least. And I just got back in after a very long uh, hiatus, I guess you could say. Uh, apparently after killing three of the high members, they... Uh, decided to bring me in after a while. <laughs> so I say after a while, it was, uh, I got kicked out of section 13 when I was about 11 to 12 years old. Uh, and they had just brought me back in almost six years ago. That's, that's a huge gap. All right. Well, Francine, um, I mean, it, I guess the answer in my response to that is uh, it varies based on the group and the technology they have. But mm -hmm. it's, I think if it's uh, LOC, a Lunar Operations, Lunar Space Command, uh, typically it's uh, one week for every 10 years. So, uh, yeah, typically a 20-year service. You have to be restrained for two weeks, and it's not very much not much fun there. Actually, none of this is really much fun, um, yeah. except maybe the time they allow us to have a, a ship leave if you happen to be a high enough officer, <laughs> not a slave. Uh, well, I kind of liked the fighting. That was like, it was one of the best things. <laughs> okay, so let's move on here. Uh, my question is, James, is she stuck on a time loop? In what context? Like I've time, I've parallel universe jumped before where I've relived years, even though some of the events were different. I think what Chaotic is asking is about your life as Epsilon Queen. Is that, um, is that in the here and now or is that back in time mm -hmm. or is that in the future? No, it would be the here and now. So you're not, so not only you're here, you're also out there too. Your soul is in the same body, a different bodies. Uh, well that, that depends. I do have a lot of clones of me out there that I've noticed and have realized, but they only have certain, it's like fragmentation. So they only have like a certain part of me. But this consciousness, when I go on missions, which I get picked up almost every night, um, this consciousness goes on those missions. I do have the ability to tap into some of my clones where I can get residual feedback and whatnot, but it's not constant like when I'm on my missions. Question from RV there yet. <laughs> Question. <laughs> Um, how often do you feel like you have control over the amount and type of info that you're recalling? Uh, is it, are these like huge flashes of memories or, um, yeah. So how, what is it like? Well, it really depends because of my mind suppressant that I had during, after I got out of section 13 because of the revolt they ended up suppressing a lot of my memories and it literally wiped out most of my childhood, including a lot of my schooling. Um, when I started getting my memories back from the projects back then, it was just like, some of it was just in spurts. Some of it didn't make sense. I really had to do a lot of meditation. I really had to, you know, when I started, um, talking to certain people, like I have a group that actually remembers me in the projects and when I start talking, they start remembering. And it, it can kind of like open up memories really quickly without cold reading, you know. And then some of the memories of missions, it's like I come back, they set me back down in my bed, and I write in my journal as much as possible because the memories can go like that immediately. Thank you. All right, from Bottega Verati. Uh, Apollomy, uh, do you know how to stop telepathy to get mental peace from abuse? Yes, you have to learn how to mind shield yourself. <laughs> and it takes a lot of practice because it depends on who is trying to 
read your thoughts, you have like five different uh, forms of brain waves, and each of them can be tapped into sometimes simultaneously, and sometimes entities can only tap into your awake and subconscious. So you basically just have to learn how to shield your thoughts, and it is a very long process and takes a lot of time, but it is possible. Outside Tesserat as asking, why are the people you're working for so rude to you? Shouldn't they be appreciative of what you can do? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> we can do. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to laugh. This is a great question. A lot of people who say that they're in SSP and stuff, they may have been in the military. Uh, people like me don't get into the military. We are usually chosen uh, from what I am, you know, experienced in not only being in, but uh, the, the group that I am in that actually remembers me. We had no idea. But when they bring us in, they do not treat us like soldiers. They treat us like experiments. They treat us like slaves. Like we're indebted to them the moment that we're born. Now, I was actually created to be an experiment to be a soldier uh, and utilized in this fashion. But there's no holds over there. There's no rules of human or animal like rights. Okay, we, we go in, we do what we have to do and to get trained. And unfortunately, the people that were running the projects were not good people. They did not care. Uh, they worked for a lot of the organizations that are trying to rule this country and this world right now in a bad manner. And I'm on YouTube, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> so... They have expectations of how to deal with people that they consider slaves or cannon fodder, for the better terms. And unfortunately, um, that's just the way they were. Now, when a certain president, who is no longer president, came in, things got a lot better for us. A lot of those people got fired. They got stripped of their rankings and got out of the projects. And we actually had rights. We actually got a lot better treatment and actually treated like civil people versus animals. So, and even though he's not in office anymore, luckily for some of the projects, not all have remained that way. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So Carrie Ann is asking, do they keep pulling you back now in for more missions? Yes. I am still active for certain projects. Yeah, and I, I am too as well. Um, and I think we're going to be stuck in this for a very long time. There's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of problems out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so let's see here. Somebody's asking, can we see pictures of your clones? Uh, if I had a picture of my clones, that would be awesome because I'm sure some of them. <laughs> uh, well, I mean... So people have to understand that that clones, all of them do have souls, all right? Even though they share a part of your energy signature, it's like twin syndrome almost. Uh, and you you can get that twin effect too. That's that's how we link to, to them. They have another person, another entity soul in them, but they have all of our DNA uh, for the body. And it can get quite confusing for the soul sometimes. Well, but what about this? Where are your clones? Where are they? Uh, some of them are in with the projects, which is kind of agitating. Uh, I had, I have literally been cloned since I was a kid. So God only knows <laughs> where some of them are. I have actually met my clones before and that was a whole new identity crisis <laughs> and uh, mental fortitude of figuring out who I am. But uh, those ones that I had met were basically made for bioweapons. They were made for medical um, 
like medical organs and everything else. They were basically being used for harvesting. Yeah. So as far as if I was to answer the question, uh, our clones are all over the place. They sell out our DNA to different planetary corporations. Uh, one of the things they actually tell my clone on the moon, James Ring, is that um, that me and the here and now have, have been that I'm selling my DNA to the planetary corporations to make a bunch of money. Uh, so he was he was all upset, thinking I'm making a bunch of money from this, and I'm making absolutely nothing. Uh, so yeah, but um, in my book, um, if you get a copy of my book on my website, I go into some of the uh, remote views, some of the the cloning chambers where they keep us at. Uh, another one was under um, with the Five Star Corporation. Um, so that one was the, the Derek Reinhold stuff. But uh, yeah, you can learn a little bit what, what those cloning labs are like. But um, let me go here with the Thomas is asking a question. By the way, Thomas, thank you for your contribution for this video with the introduction. But Thomas uh, wants to know if you had any communication with any of your alters and uh, do you have any male alters? Yeah, I've had some communication with some of my alters before. Um, I don't really like myself sometimes. <laughs> it's it's very interesting dealing with myself. I mean, I understand that they have different souls in them, even though they're still in my genetics. Uh, but it can be a very kind of territorial interaction. Yeah. As for male alters, I have had a few, but um, rarely. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, one female. I think I actually have two, but one that I know that they use me, at, I think at Kruger, uh, Genoa. Um, she is a lesbian, but uh, <laughs> uh, she's drop dead gorgeous and um, she's pretty damn badass. But uh, other than that, I'm going to keep those memories in a little pocket in my head so I don't have to deal with them right now. But um, yeah, that, that is an issue that, that does crop up here, pop up for experiencers that are in these particular projects. Okay. How can you tell who's a hybrid and who's human? So that's a very interesting question. Um, it really depends. I actually made a test. <laughs> for for people to answer certain questions it's like a 52 questionnaire test because when i first started all of my journey of trying to figure out what the heck has been happening to me my entire life at first i i knew i just wasn't human and it started off that way of my curiosity of like there has to be more than than just me as being not human and so I made the, this test because I have ran into a few other hybrids before and they smell different. Their, their pheromone chemistry is different. Uh, if you think about it as like for pheromones, if you take a tiger, a lion, you know, a cougar, they're all going to have a similar scent to them because that is their like, oh, I, I don't remember the, there's like a phylum or class they belong in one one tree of the genetic spectrum. And so there's going to be a certain gen, uh, genetic pheromone marker. The same thing is for humans. It doesn't matter wherever they come from, from the world. And ETs are the same way. They all have certain species scents for pheromones. And when you come across a hybrid, they're going to smell possibly half human and something else. And I've come across, like I said, I've come across a few people like this, and some of them are reptilian, some of them are um, Palladian, some of them are Syrian. Uh, I've met an Arcturian, a hybrid Arcturian here before on Earth, like walking around just like everybody else. So uh, their abilities can be different, as in sensatories, so they could have um, better hearing, better sight, better S or ESP you know, empathy, that sort of thing. Uh, so somebody's asking about physical evidence. Do you think you could provide physical evidence? What physical evidence do you have of your experiences in the secret, secret space, space program? program. Uh, I have abduction marks, if that's evidence enough for you. <laughs> I've got yeah. bruises. I've got 
I had a, I had a caretaker for 24 seven for almost a year and they can tell you that I've been missing in my bed and there's no way that I can get out of there without them noticing because their bedroom is like facing the hallway that I have to go down. Um, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't even matter how much evidence we throw out there if, if someone's skeptical, then they're just not going to believe and it's okay to be skeptical, but you know, like I said, I've, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been getting injection marks, um, almost on a daily basis for, uh, nearly uh, 17 years now. Mm -hmm. I've posted pictures all over the place, um, in uh, old videos. It's also in my book, but it's to the point now I just don't really care anymore. Uh, trying to prove people like Ben, uh, your physical evidence. Um, so let's see here. Um, should we, how about this? How about we pause asking questions? You said you had another experience you wanted to share. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this mission was in April 2nd of 2022. I cannot disclose the location um, because I am under contract, I can disclose anything past three years in full detail. Uh, but because of the new contract I have with certain organizations, I can't. Otherwise, I just don't get to go on missions anymore, and that super sucks for me. So this mission was also kind of on a, a desolate planet. There wasn't really any floral fauna on the side that we were going to. I had six members with me. We were basically told that this human establishment was having issues with the local ETs or what do you call them? Terrestrials, the, the local inhabitants of, of the planetoid that, that we were on. And they were coming into their facilities and just messing everything up. So we were going over there to protect this facility and its inhabitants. I'm not allowed to disclose the name of the inhabitants <laughs> for obvious reasons. And, you know, it's just been kind of scuffles here or there with like maybe five or six of the inhabitants coming over and causing issues. A couple of the members got killed. So I guess they just hired us to go over and deal with the situation and, and you know, be like, oh, okay, basically bodyguarding. Well, what was supposed to be an easy bodyguarding ended up turning into a raid. And mind you, there's only six of us there. This building is about five stories tall. We're talking um, technology. For, it was a scientific building. They had technology for, for starting to grow plants. Uh, technology for hybridization of animals that could live on this planetoid. There was technology for medical advancements over there, technology for the um, all of the actual technology that they were going to need for like uh, workings of the cars, vehicles, that sort of thing, their building structures. And at first, we only saw like five or ten of these little creatures, and they looked like really kind of dark brown, your typical gray ET um, body type, but they were brown. They had uh, four claws on their hands and the big black eyes, completely bald, slender. You know, and we're like, oh, these guys are really kind of giving you issues. That's kind of weird. They, they look, you know, I, I assume that most of these ET types would have, you know, uh, empathy and a lot of ESP abilities, but like most of them do. And what ended up being like seven to 10, just kind of wandering around and we were just kind of keeping an eye on them. Uh, we ended up getting alarms as some of them have snuck into the building and we ended up going into the building and they were everywhere. And I mean, not just like 15, there was like 20, 30 of them and they kept coming into the building. We had no idea how they got in here. So we are scrambling 
from the rooftop all the way down to try and figure out where they came from and trying to eliminate these things. And they proved to be a little bit more of a handful than normal. I don't know what hybrid these guys were, but they actually had sharp pointy T's and their mouths actually elongated a little bit. Now, most gray ATs that I know of, like their mouths are only like this wide most of the time, but these guys actually went up to like here, which is a little creepy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. We ended up dealing with these guys for the most of it. We got down to the basement level and it looked like they had actually blasted a hole in the basement, but they just kept coming. And we only saw this through the cameras but they just kept coming in. And then we had another like enforcement group that also started coming in. And I actually have a picture of these little guys. My drawings are terrible without like a lot of work. I apologize. Let's see if I can get this here. So they looked like this. They almost kind of looked like a hybrid of a triceratops type creature and a gray. So like that, this is the, the face. And then this is like the, the body type and their legs are actually a little bit bigger than this and they can move really fast. And they started coming in and I literally just, I didn't even know what to do. We got so overran so quickly. The only thing that we could do was literally try and save as many people as possible at this point. And so I started phasing through as many doors as possible, trying to like open them ahead of the people that were running for the scientists and the crew and some of my teammate members. And we got quite a bit of people out of the building. And then we ended up having to take out the floor level of one of the walls to get outside. And we were running halfway around the building and kind of sneaking around because they, these creatures were so enthralled on trying to get into the building and then just basically destroying it, I guess. But the six of us were sneaking around to the side and the, the other humans were trying to get to like escape pods that they had outside of the building and we were trying to escort them off, off to the side. And I turned around and saw this creature that was really tall. It was like six feet. And it was really hard to kind of de decipher what was a face and a head and eyes because it looks, if you wrap someone in like moss and, and leaves, that's pretty much like the texture of this creature. And he was, they were like kind of just ducking around on this huge boulder and watching this building get raided. And, and it looked like they, he they were part of its crew. And I got really curious as to what was going on, truthfully. You know, most soldiers just like take orders and do everything else. I have never been, um, <laughs> uh, I'm a little unorthodox, let's put it that way. So I actually started going down there to talk to this creature and my teammates were like, what are you doing? You're going to get us caught. Don't do this. And I told them to just go get the people to safety. And so I walked down kind of like this gully area to where this creature was hiding behind the boulder. And I actually, I didn't have any weapons in my hand or anything like that. I just held my hands up walking towards it. And I asked it, I was like, what do you guys want? Like, what is your purpose for this raid? And the creature turned around and telepathically talked to me. And it was like, you need to stay where you are. Don't come near me too much, you know. And then it actually called for backup. And I was like surrounded by the um, little, not triceratop ones, but the, the uh, brown gray T ones. And I, I told him, I was like, just take me to your superior officer or take me to who you take orders from. And that didn't really seem to register. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this. Would you just take me to your leader? OK. And they kind of got the, the reference after a little while of communication 
barriers. And there was this very interesting entity that ended up walking up towards me. He looks Octarian, right? This was a very tall entity, very blue skinned, uh, bald. But the thing that I, and I've, I've met plenty of Octarians out in space. The weird thing for me is this one actually had cybernetics on them. And they had this like uh, chest vest on basically with this like little kind of pack on the end. And it actually had these like tentacle hands that came out and they were completely metal, completely made out of metal. And they actually had like a breathing apparatus on that was made out of glass over his head. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is kind of weird. But I, it, that one was actually one of their leaders. And I asked him to take me to like their highest leader. And I told my group to just go on, go without me because I can create the Stargate portals to get back to safety whenever I need to. So they left me and I ended up got, getting taken to almost, I'd say a quarter of a mile to, or, or longer to a base of operations. And their leader was one of the mossy like creatures that I saw. And it, I talked to him and it turns out that the human inhabitants was overstepping their bounds on the agreed territory that they could inhabit without seeking the wrath basically of these uh, terrestrials and that they were doing experiments and uh, taking resources that weren't theirs. And so I ended up getting a hold of my group because we have augments that allow us to do that and basically settling this whole ordeal with no fighting, basically just, it was just a huge miscommunication and people overstepping their bounds, which, you know, is okay for, no, well, it's not, it's not okay, but like, it's okay that it, the mission ended up not dealing with a whole bunch of blood massacre. So not all of our missions end up with uh, complete blood massacres. All right. Thank you for sharing that. That's an amazing story. So um, I guess at the end of the day, were, did, were the, did the humans learn their lesson to uh, treat these, uh, these, the species with a little bit more respect as equals? It sounded like by the the full end of it that their leaders were willing to talk with the, the head scientists or the people who were in charge of the facility and get everything kind of straightened out. Um, it sounded like the humans were trying to buy off, of, you know, oh, well, we didn't know. And I'm like, seriously, like <laughs> this is kind of important <laughs> if you don't want to wage war. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any information how you actually created those portals or that portal? I have been able to do that ever since I was a kid, uh, before I went on the, well, before I got kicked out. And that was because they actually started using us as guinea pigs, throwing us through the, what most people would call the Stargate portals, uh, in area 51 to see what was basically on the other side. They didn't like, again, they didn't care about us, especially if we we're using the avatar program. So they would just push us through, figure out what was on the other side. We basically did surveillance and reported what was on the other side. When I started going through them conse consecutively, uh, I started to be able to feel the physics that, was happening when they, you know, pushed us through. And so one of my abilities is mimicking. And I basically started to learn how to mimic. And it took me a while to learn that my explosions that I could make were actually not too far of a step from actually just making wormholes. <laughs> so um, as far as going through this Stargate I'm assuming this is at section 13, 32 C and area yeah. 52. Yes. Um, so they actually have a Stargate there. Uh, yes. Can they... you describe what that looks like? 
So the older Stargates basically were just a ring. That's it. And you didn't have to really type any code or anything like that uh, on the ring itself. I, I know everyone thinks of Stargate as the show. Um, I can't watch that show too much. It actually gives me PTSD. <laughs> I, I tried. I, I literally tried. Um, but it, it's literally just like the silver metal ring that is on the stand. And when they actually activate the Stargate for putting in all the frequencies and coordinates, um, it basically just all they use is like a single drop of water. That's it. And then it just basically explodes into this huge disk of water surface of plasma. And then you just walk right through. We have little disks now that are just kind of like a octagonal ones where we can just throw down. And those are our relay disks where we just step on them and they will actually take us to our rendezvous points. And then they disintegrate. But in dire needs, I usually can make a Stargate. But it's not foolproof. I've actually jumped parallel universes doing that, which my group was not very thankful for. <laughs> when you when you do the uh, the parallel universe jumping, is it hard to come back to the here and now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not entirely fully like 100% for destination. Uh, sometimes I can get it on point and sometimes I can't just because I haven't been able to practice it as much as I would like to, but you can see why they don't really let me do that a whole lot. Tell us about um, a time when you actually went to a parallel universe. What, what was it? How was it different over there? So it's almost exactly like the one that you're currently in, except for the year can change. The dates can change. Uh, I have jumped literally years behind. So say I was in 2022 and I ended up doing a time jump of either messing up on my, um, my Stargate or some other weird event has happened where I ended up time jumping. I've literally jumped back to 2020 before from 2022 to 2020. I've had to live all of that all over again. And some events change and some events don't change. The biggest change that I had last time that I jumped, Trump got back in office, World War III didn't happen, you know, and this time around, none of that happened. So it's kind of freaking me out a little bit because I'm like, can I, can I go back into the other one? Like it was a lot better. <laughs> so you're saying this timeline was supposed to have World War, World War III? The other timeline I was in was on the brink of World War III. But that World War III start, almost started in, in April. And Trump got back into office and literally it all just dropped overnight completely. And then Atlantis showed up almost a few weeks later. So like Atlantis actually merged up again a few weeks later. And then a couple uh, weeks after that, I ended up time jumping, which I was not happy about. Well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. You said Atlantis came up from the mm -hmm. sea? Yeah. Yeah. I was actually on the news stations. What was it like? Um, like the content on, under the ocean rose up and there was ancient ruin, ruins or was another alternate reality. It blended in. No, 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 no. So Atlantis Citadel, the city got destroyed. And when it actually uh, went under the sea is technically when the sea levels rose during the floods. Um. The Citadel came came back up and it actually surfaced uh, somewhere in the Atlantic. But that thing can move around on its own volition. Uh, are you familiar with the term Ashland? Ashland? Mm -mm. Uh, Ashland is the name of at least one of the biodomes on the bottom of the sea right now. There's approximately 300 million people that live down there. The Navy's been trying to penetrate the uh, the structure to get in there, but uh, yeah, there's a uh, Atlantis. Is, uh, some of those people down there are over a hundred thousand years old. Mm -hmm. They're between uh, seven and nine foot tall. So, and they're they're not very um, um, friendly towards a uh, surface dwellers. Well, I can't hopefully, blame them. <laughs> well, hopefully, <laughs> in the future maybe there can be some kind of dialogue that we can our group. Our um, you know, our races can cooperate mutually cooperate. 
But um, that's interesting. So um, back in April, according to this, uh, there was a report uh, by the Guardians of the Looking Glass that there would be a false um, FLAD and new NYC Times Square that would kill about 4,000 people. And on that same day, I think it was like April 20th or something, um, there was a bunch of signs. Uh, we stand with Ukraine all over the place in Times Square. And I'm thinking, well, because they were going to blame it on um, Russia. And that, that's that would have been – so when that would have happened, the next event would have been an anthrax scare in D.C., which killed 4 million people. And then the cabal retaliated against Russia. And then at that point, uh, Russia has technology to shoot all the, all, the, all the nukes out of the sky, and they retaliated by um, leveling – about 50 million people in the United States. Um, another 10 million died from starvation and then months after that. It was an absolute disaster. So I'm glad that timeline has not happened, but now it's almost like CERN has changed everything. Nobody really knows where, where we're headed. Where, where do you think we're headed? Actually, that's one of the questions here. Um, what can you comment uh, just, on the potential future? Oh my gosh, like it's so diverse. I don't even know anymore. I thought I knew. I used to have future sight really well, um, but that all changed in like 2016. So honestly, with me time jumping so much and parallel universe hopping so much, I have no clue. I really cannot tell you. Like it's starting to um, freak me out, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I, I used to make, I use my future sight a lot usually. Okay. Um, well, how about we go back to the Stargate? Uh, can you tell us how wide it actually was or how big the, the event aperture was? Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to remember. You can at least, like it, it would be at least like, I would say if you're, if you're going to, oh, so if it's a circle and you're just going through the full circumference, maybe 10 to 12 people wide, it's not like one of the huge ones. All right. Next question. Um, on these other worlds that the Stargates are connected to, I mean, potentiality, there could be viruses or toxins mm -hmm. or germs or whatnot that could um, infect you. And then when you come back, it could potentially kill everyone on the planet. So how do they get around all that when you're doing, when they're doing this type of travel? So we usually get, um, cleansed when we get to base after they pick us up from our beds, we get cleansed on base. And then we get cleansed as, when we get into our suits before we go on our missions. And then after our missions, we go right back to the med, uh, not med beds, but uh, back to the medical facilities after being cleansed, the medical facilities, and then they basically scan us and diagnose us if we have anything, and then they treat us after that. Well, did anybody ever get really sick? Yeah, actually, one of my last missions, uh, which I'm sure we'll do in another one, I actually got infected with a parasite, <laughs> and I ended up infecting about 14 other crew members before we even got uh, back to the main base. So I guess the moral story is don't eat any of the food over there. Uh, no, I actually got infected with, by an entity on my mission. I ended up in a fight with it and lost because I do not win all the time. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Jimmy Payne, he's commented that uh, he he went on to the moon. Um, I think this is like in one of the Apollo missions, but he, he, he launched out from Area 51 on uh, one of the saucer craft to, to observe the Apollo missions with uh, – this gray called sweetie and when he was walking on the moon even though he had a space suit on there were worms in the soil that got into his suit and he had to get chemotherapy because uh these worms were so um so different to go off yeah that the only thing <laughs> killed him was chemo yeah um anyway so um i guess that's pretty much all the i mean oh how about this can what was it like actually crossing through the stargate did did you see like a long tunnel or is it like instantaneous like you're here and then you're there What's so it? when you actually cross through the Stargate, it's basically light speed traveling also. So you see a lot of prismatic light coming around in the circles. And then um, it's it's really kind of weird. I, I wish I had that toy that 
uh, represents like what an actual Stargate actually is. It's like a balloon toy, but it's like you can put your fingers in it and it still like wraps around your fingers. And then if you do this, it is like a continuous tube. I I'm going to have to find one. <laughs> it's just easier to explain. But you basically see a lot of prismatic light. You feel like you don't have really too much of um, gravity because your gravity is completely like almost non-existent as you're being like, it's like the sucking motion and then a pushing motion halfway through. It's very bizarre and it's very disorienting. You usually throw up if you're not used to it after a while. Um, and it can take you a little bit to get your ground on the other side. And just hope that you never, ever, ever, ever cross the stream. Can you tell us uh, how far into the future you've been to? The furthest into the future that I remember, but I don't have a whole lot of memory memories. Wow. I don't have a whole lot of memories because I'm still trying to unlock them was like 2035, I believe. Okay, we're dying to know what was it like there. Was it he, was it on this planet? Uh, yes, it was on this planet, but it was in a different parallel universe. The technology was way more advanced. Well, by all means, to, oh, like how advanced? Like what oh. did you? <laughs> Sorry, you know, like, flying cars or? Well, we're talking like skyscrapers made with a black metal that is very durable and still flexible so that it can withstand winds and earthquakes and catastrophic events. Uh, the glass is also a little bit more flexible as well. You have your floating cars from the electromagnetic technology. Uh, the med beds are out. Time travel is out. Parallel universe hopping is out, you know, so people are living longer and it's definitely ruled with an iron fist, especially when it comes to rules and laws, but it's a decent, a decently happy one. And I know most people aren't going to like this. Uh, back then it was one government ruled the entire world. But everyone got fed, everyone got education, everyone would, had their needs met properly. All right. Um, yeah, well, that almost seems like that might be manifesting um, a lot. Uh, like I think it was, um, was it Al Balik? He went into the future uh, roughly five or 700 years, and he saw something very similar, what you described. Of course, mm -hmm. that was... Yeah, events are different in that timeline, but I uh, saw floating cities and mm -hmm. um, everything was being run by AI. And uh, basically, um, it was a fully like a 100% socialistic society. And they were actually just dis discussing about maybe taking away some of the socialism because people lost motivation to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Humanity has been a slave race for such a long time that if we were suddenly became a utopia society, I, I don't, I, I think we're like genetically program to not be able to handle it kind of <laughs> sad, but anyhow let's move on to some other actually is there anything else you want to share about the stargate before we move on um like there isn't the stargates that that we use there isn't another stargate on the other side you literally have your coordinates that are frequencies and mathematics that you put into it and it will actually open a Stargate portal to that side. There is no other mechanism on the other side. And what does it actually look like? The, the color of the portal, is it like a bright flashlight, a flash of light, or is it like oh, a lot it, of in the TV that, show? That depends because depending on the colors, depending on what it does, there, there is uh, gold, red, and blue and purple. So destinations are usually a blue, um, dimensions are usually a purple, and I don't remember what the red ones do, but the gold ones are time travel. I know that. And what about the rainbow portals? Uh, well, so when you step into them, that's the, the rainbow coloring that you see, because you're not only light speed traveling, you are also... Um, depending on which one it is, you're also dimensionally traveling. If you're time traveling, when you go through the silver or golden, the golden ones, 
uh, if you are time traveling in the past, it will be a, there will be a silver spiral going with the prismatic like tube that you're flowing in. If you're going into the future, you will have a golden spiral and it will actually go from uh, this way. The silver spiral will be this way. Wow. All right. Well, um, so I guess we can, I've got some questions here that we discussed before. But let's just quickly get through this because this was actually from the last show. The average age of life forms off world. What do you think about that? That depends on if they are spacefaring. That depends on if they are, okay, I guess the easiest terminology would be, it depends on your gravity. <laughs> because... If you take a human and put it on one planet that's gravitational and um, planetary, planetary rotation is different from Earth, that human can live a really long time. It could be thousands of years old, you know, especially depending on how much quanta the food has or, and, you know, just uh, all things varied in general. So, and then of course here, humans only have a certain amount of lifetime because our food is terrible. We don't have much quanta here on this planet and our healthcare is terrible. <laughs> so it varies. It also varies on the species. Oh, oh, you know what? I guess I can, let me comment, but, um, yeah, you're right. So, so, th so there are some humans, they only live like 15 years, you know, 15 years. Um, there's some planets that are like volcanic where they're harvesting, like I think Thomas Alvin, he's been on the show and he mentioned that there was a planet where, the uh, Germans were collecting red mercury, and it was a very toxic environment. The average age was close to 30. Um, there's some other planets where humans are living well. Like I said, the Lixodotin, the, the, where they got the DNA from Lixodotin, the, the Atlantean uh, bloodlines, those those people can live for 120,000 years. So it all depends. Um, yeah, that's. I would just say it's a loaded question. Yeah, you can't yeah. really say it's very similar. <laughs> Have you ever had a miscarriage? I think I answered this one on our last one. Um, yes, but never documented. Because when I did have my miscarriages, uh, they were actually taken out of me and then uh, growing in the artificial wombs, which are my three children. Okay, how about this? Tell us more about the race that you had a child with. I had a children with two different races. One of them is the Chakrell. They are the, what most people call the dark elves. They are really tall. Okay. They're exceptionally tall. <laughs> uh, you know, we're talking between like, they can shape shift first of all. So their, their size varies. Usually when they're around me, they are nice enough to be at least seven to nine feet tall. Uh, they can get up to like 15 feet tall. They're, they're incredibly tall. Um, coal black skin, white hair, their eye color varies from gold, amber, um, reds, and sometimes like purples, kind of like on that end of the, the spectrums. Um, they are a mixture of a dragon race and an elven race, but they always stay in their elven forms. They do not really ever turn to dragons. It's very private for them. So I've had two children with that race, and that's only been recently within the last seven years. And then the first one is um, almost immediately after I turned 18, the inner earth lady that I had experiences with, ended up coming to me with a very young strapping lad from inner earth. He was blonde haired, blue eyed, and I signed a contract with him stating that I could be part of the hybrid project again and to create a child. But my only thing was as that, that child will never see earth ever will not never step foot on earth ever. In both of these cases, was it consensual? Yes. They were both consensual. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, um, um, I have kids out there too, but, um, I don't, yeah, um, it all varies. Sometimes they just take your DNA and do what they want. And then other mm -hmm. times, it, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Th these aren't uh, to be mistaken for the clones that, uh, get taken from us. Are you familiar with the Yagel? 
A little it's, bit. Yeah, it's a type of gray. They they they've got some. I got four uh, Yael hybrids kids, and um, th there's close to three hundred of them out there. So uh, there's no point really for me to go into this. Um, it just take too long. So let's go into how about this one? This is a great question. Oh, I just lost it from Thomas. You're asking about ter terrestrial celebrities. Do you remember any ter ter terrestrial seeing ter terrestrial celebrities out there? Do you mean celebrities from Earth? No, but uh, there are people of great renown out in the the missions and everything. Me being an emissary for the Shakral, yes, I have seen quite a few of the what most people call like high councils uh, members like that. Starshooter himself is actually kind of a, I guess you would call him a celebrity. He's very renowned in the mercenary groups and uh, SSP for even Section 13 knows about him. Um, very much a sharpshooter, very good at his job. <laughs> yeah, we were actually talking a little bit about Gunkata. Is he, you think he could do Gunkata? I'm pretty sure he invented Gunkata. <laughs> <laughs> like he. Yeah, Gunkata is for people who don't know. Oh, so Gunkata is like having super high perception of the world around you and using martial arts forms with your with your guns. So instead of having a sword, you you use your your guns basically, and it literally looks like you just have precognitive abilities where everyone's going to be and what they're going to do. Uh, that's why I put the precognitive on there for for his thing because i saw how he was fighting on the battlefield and and literally he didn't have to look half the time where people were so it was kind of really fun to watch it would have been nice if i wasn't tangled and, in and they could have you could have a gun in both hands and each eye would be tracking or i guess you said he doesn't even need any eyes you know so uh yeah Okay, here's another question from Jay Whittetaker. Uh, what do you remember about the Hong Long? The Hong Long? I'm very bad with names. I'm sorry. That's the uh, Chinese breakaway. Well, really, actually, more Taiwanese than Chinese, but for SSP groups, um, I haven't really had too much interactions with them. I do know that I'm starting to get into some programs that are more overseas, like the um, um, some of the, the SSP Russian programs and some of the other programs, but I'm not allowed to disclose any of those as of yet. Otherwise, I, I really don't feel like getting and ripped the, from that one. The Soviet program, I think, was the was it red, uh, the rising red star. Um, so yeah, that one is defunct now. Uh, however, apparently there are still some holdouts, but most of them have been absorbed by the ICC. Mm. How about this question? Uh, tell us about, is, do some of these e ETs, is that one of the things they trade? Meat? Human? Y human yes. Meat? There, there is quite a few species out in the universe who eat meat and human is on the menu. I hate to say it guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're still not the top of the food chain. No one is. Um, and unfortunately humans breed a lot and a lot quicker, especially on earth. So uh, obviously some of the uh, dark Dracos uh, obviously eat human uh, there are some like hybrid gray tea species that also eat human and, you know, just like anything else, human can be on the menu anywhere in space. So you always want to know where your meat's coming from. <laughs> I've actually been to several planets that actually have restaurants and stuff like that. And they also serve human as well. Wow. Well, I, you know, I think they're Okay. Well, let's just leave it there. Um, that's pretty, you know, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> um, okay. Was your group involved in this without saying the word? Depending on more of the retrieval, not the delivery. So you were helping st stop that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so merchant marine f fleet, 
was respond was high was implicated in conducting these type of um trades uh do you, are you aware of the merchant marine fleet or mm -hmm. any all right then we can just move on here um how about when will the abductions come to an end probably never <laughs> just because the reason why people get abducted is so diverse. You've got people or like ETs who own DNA down here. You've got corporate ET corporations who own people down here through um, like banks and just, uh, medical facilities and everything else. There is a certain website and I don't remember what it's called where you can actually type in your social security number and it will tell you what companies own you. And at first I thought this was a fraud and I typed in like five people's social security numbers and some of them I just made up. And some of the corporations were the same, but the one that freaks me out the most is when I actually type mine in, it actually gave the name of my grandparents' great grandfather, like his, their line before they changed their last name was on there. And that was like completely sold for me. I was like, Oh my God, this thing is real. Did did the name uh, Vanguard come up or BlackRock? I don't I don't remember all of them, and I had lost my paperwork, which is really unfortunate to um, water damage. Uh, I do remember Hydracell being on there, and when before Google changed all of its stuff, because you know you you type in something and it catches on very quickly and immediately starts censoring a lot of things. Uh, it ended up being a bio lab where they do genetic uh, genetic experimentation and genetic engineering. And it was like, oh, well, I know where my clones are coming <laughs> from now. A lot of German factions, a lot of uh, German banks. It even had the hospitals that were nearby. Their names were on there, too. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's... That sucks. I guess they sell my DNA if I, if I can't pay my bills. I don't know. Because <laughs> they, they took a lot of blood out of me every single time I went to the hospital. So I can't hear you for some reason. The chattel property bonds are traded in uh, Switzerland and Puerto Rico. And incidentally, Switzerland is pretty much the head of the beast. Oh, that um, makes that's sense. like five star corporation is based out there. Um, Vanguard and BlackRock are are also off-world corporations. Uh, so that's why I was asking because uh, they are involved in a lot of that. Yeah, the, the website was free when I first started using it, but now they're asking like a hundred bucks or so. Of course. Yeah. Uh, someone was asking about crystal warp drives or light speed travel. Do you, have you uh, inter, um, interface of any of that, event, that type of technology? Yeah, a lot of ETs do not have actual true crystal technology. It is extremely high technology. Um, and so like the laws of the ETs are if you don't know how to use it, you don't get it. <laughs> Which is also why the med beds are not coming out because in order to get them, you have to know how to use them and be consciously, you know, of their uses. So Crystal warp drives are basically one of the highest technologies that you can get for warp drives. And I wouldn't even call them warp drives. It's more of like uh, time splitting. It's kind of like the Stargate technology, except for you can also travel dimensions a lot easier with the crystal uh, technology. And they go a lot faster. There is things that do travel faster than the speed of light. And there are... Um, colors that also travel faster than what humans know right now. Uh, for most of the light speed travel, people are only traveling in the um, visual spectrum, but the uh, black light spectrum and the light spectrum that is above that, I call it pastel. It's, it's called actually something else out there actually travel a lot faster. So you could literally get from one side of the universe to the other in like, I'd say like 10 minutes, generally speaking. Do you think the ICC or Dark Fleet has access to that type of technology? It, I don't know about Dark Fleet. I know the Shakrell have this technology and they used to be affiliated with a lot of the um, unsavory but also still savory people. They're, they're kind of like a middle people, uh, middle alliance, <laughs> but they don't give technology out for cheap. 
So if you don't have the coin in your pocket, you're not getting it. Yeah. Hence, hence that's the, the previous question that the word that I'm not allowed to say on here, why they're doing that abducting people and selling them as products off world. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have anyone that is uh, handling you or watching you? What do you think? Uh, I have the FBI who watch me. I know that. <laughs> they, they like to go through and sweep all my stuff every once in a while off of Facebook. I do have agents who actually stop by my house and watch me from afar, though they have uh, tabs of not keeping contact, like actual coming up and talking to me. Uh, I do have some SSP buddies who are still in high contact with certain agencies as well that keep tabs on me. And I'm glad that I do because I ended up having a stalker last year for six months. And I mentioned one thing and that person never came around again. <laughs> so, yeah, well, my response is uh, they watch all of us are very, very closely. So uh, you can pretty much expect that to be the case. All right. So have you seen any uh, Squatch, Sasquatch or, um, yeah, on your missions or in the programs? So there actually is a species called the Sambrinians who look very much like a Sasquatch. They are very telepathic, very conscious of the planets and, and everything around them. They're not exactly technologically advanced, um, but they are still part of the Universal Council that sometimes you get to see them in the, in the major meetings that I get to go to as an emissary. So that has nothing to do with SSP. My emissary work is completely different from my SSP stuff. Just to let people know, because I feel like people are getting really confused <laughs> on, on that. Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to find some image images, but I don't know. I've got so much stuff. Let's just move on here. Uh, let's see here. We've got... Oh, we had a few more. Oh, the cyborgs. Uh, so, uh, what can you tell us about the cyborgs? It really depends on, I can tell you some stuff about the cyborgs as for what factions they work for. They could work for anybody. It, it's not that hard to create them as soon as you get kind of, uh, your, your space credits, space, space credits, basically. Um, they can be almost fully to an android or you can actually they sometimes can have like an organic flesh uh that makes a person look completely human but they are still technically cyborg the technology for cyborgs is really advanced depending on your coin like Sabretooth definitely looked more cyborgy he his arm and a quarter of his face was uh plated you know, you could tell that his arm was metal. So um, the mantis had some cybernetics, which is very odd as well. I've never seen a mantis have cybernetics on them. And he actually had uh, some of his fingers and uh, some of his arms as well that were uh, cyborged and metaled. They can enhance strength. You've got the scanning technology. You can basically do anything that you really want with the cyborgs. Uh, sometimes they are... I don't know if they're really used so much in Section 13 because most of us are just either ET hybrids or uh, full ETs for Section 13. We don't really have a whole lot of just humans in Section 13, though most of them are use for remote viewing. I have seen them on other missions from other factions, but not a whole lot. All right. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And I want to, this is my SSP 101 PowerPoint. Uh, so um, cyber life is uh, one of these planetary corporations. They're based in the future um, but, uh, that was spun off from cyber life came skyline. So skyline is a sister company, cyber life. They make cyborgs and AI technology on Mars to build, built out for dark fleet. 
I would not be surprised if the Japanese are involved because the Japanese usually are the ones that are very um, have the most advanced robotics, and they're the ones that are trading with Dark Fleet to get um, ship drives and um, technology because the Germans are really good at building sh um, sh spaceships. But their AI has become compromised, and they are now considered a rogue negative AI. There's an alternate reality linked to our dimension that is seeking to make Skyline more positive. Skynet, Skynet broke off from Skyline associated bringing about a more positive AI into our timeline to help cyborgs and assist humanity. So going in more about the, the cyborgs, they require a lot of maintenance and are in engineering to keep running in a good function. They're used throughout all planetary corporations, various tasks. Cyborgs are created by making a clone and then removing and replacing its limbs of artificial limbs or armor. Some are given tails to help them offset balance issues, such as in low G environments. Sometimes the memory centers in their brains will be removed, which makes them perfect assassins. They re may remove their hypothalamus, brainstem, or medulla and keep only a lower brainstem functionality. The goal is to remove higher cognitive function in memory so they can be sent on missions and not be aware of other, of other missions if they are caught. So there you go. All right. <laughs> I guess we can I think that was a lot. Oh, if you want to comment about that, you can, but. I guess we, well, we can just move on. I know we're jumping around here. It's a lot of different Q and A here. How about we just go ahead and go to this question? Religions. Did you encounter any religions off world? Uh, more like philosophies, but there are some religions. Like there, are, uh, the Draconians actually have a very interesting religion. They are, uh, some of them actually worship Tiamat, who they claim to be as the like all draconian uh, dragon mother of the multiverse. And their religion is very interesting because even though people think that they're just mo monster eating, you know, child, eh, they already know most of it. And we're talking about the dark draconians, not all draconians. Um, their, their philosophies about their religion is very, very interesting because it's like you respect nature, you respect yourself you put yourself first and, you know, for taking care of yourself and then you put your family second and, you know, you always put your elders first. So your devotion is always, always, always to your elders, which is probably why they have such a high drive of the draconian Queens. But, and then the philosophies of the Syrians are really interesting because they, worship what most people will call source and they do it in a very zenful manner and it kind of reminds me of the like tibetan monks almost only a lot more refined and kind of like um they don't have as many deities <laughs> or um mentors i should say but there's there's is really awesome because they they do a lot of their like meditation and stuff also in a martial arts form. So I would not mess with a Syrian. They will they look very thin, but they are surprisingly very strong. <laughs> they will put you on your butt very quickly uh, without their psionic abilities. And then just there was like a couple others out there that are really really interesting. But a lot of them, a lot of ETs just what worship or have the philosophy of source in general like you know all of the energy comes from one place we all share the consciousness you know and, and it has to do with the level of ascension that they're at basically where they start to realize that the sooner you start realizing that everything is going to be beneficial if we work all together you know and in harmony or balance you know balance is not entirely harmony it's you know there's a give and take there has to be a give and take always a give and take so but yeah those are the only two ones that i really have been consciously aware of that i learned while trying to get the information of why the war started the the huge galactic war between the syrians and dromedans and the uh, dark dracos so it was really interesting and very insightful to see both of their uh, religions and philosophies. Thank you. Well, uh, the only thing I can comment about that, at least from the dark fleets perspective is, uh, they, they promote, uh, mostly atheism. They certainly didn't bring men, uh, Judaism with them and, or Islam or Christ, much Christianity <laughs> off world. But, uh, as far as like the cyborgs and a cyborg body, they certainly weren't really interested in any kind of 
spirituality <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, generally the more spirit the more spirituality he has the more connection you have to source and the whole point is to uh keep us from separated from that because then if we start integrating we get our memories back and uh, they don't that's yeah, that's part of how they control us and going into this question is why weren't your memories wiped they were i just got them back <laughs> So there's three ways on how to suppress memories. Either they actually damage your brain tissue physically, um, but I body swap a lot, so that's not overly going to matter so much, especially if they're taking DNA from the, the, the body that they originally made for me. And it was kind of funny because the, the other day I got into a talking with one of my ET med team members and they're like, we're not understanding why you're having such a hard time integrating into your bodies for your memories and your powers. Cause I started getting into this. Oh, I don't have my original body. I can't use my powers type mind frame. And they're like, you've been body swapped since you were a kid constantly into clones. Why are you having this now? And they're like, well, I didn't know that I had that, you know, it's only been a certain time frame. So physically damaging my brain to remove my memories would only work for so long because I get swapped out every other couple days. Uh, and there are some people that I have, you know, been with that they have that physical brain wipe. The second one is um, more of like going in and making sure they, they use technology for this. They kind of just like scramble your brain for uh, these chemicals and um, like frequency technology just to kind of like mess with your memories. The link is still there. So if you really, really meditate on it, then it becomes easier to unlock. And then the third one is a simple like almost hypnosis where you're going to be like, you don't remember these, you know, <laughs> those ones are easy to get away from with simple meditation. The other ones require a heavy dose of meditation where you're, you might get spurts here and there, and then you might need some trigger words or like someone talking about a certain event or watching a certain TV, whatever. And it, it's all your memories come flooding back at once and you're just like overwhelmed. So they were wiped. I had a, what was supposed to be a past life regression ended up being a reclaiming my SSP and government programs, um, memory recall. And also maybe, um, uh, I think if you were involved in these programs and you were experiencing severe amounts of trauma, mm -hmm. um, it may not be the best course of action to recover your memories because it could create a schizophrenic type situation until I think until med beds come out where technology could release to help people that have been through this. It's probably not necessarily a bad thing that your memories aren't coming back. It's definitely been a journey to like figuring out everything and having to deal with it without any sort of fallback because seeing the other clones of me, I was like, why do I even exist? You know, why do they even have me here? Why are they even bringing me on missions? Why are they even keeping me down here? It, it was this huge psychological journey and, um, I'm still going through a lot of things. I'm still trying to figure out a lot of things. You know, I want the answers to my projects because they have affected my life way more than I realize and have ever realized, you know, and I'm just like, can I revert some of this stuff? <laughs> you know, I don't mind keeping the, oh, I look helpless and then something terrible happens and then I face through a wall or something, but it's, yeah. All right. So to, here's a great comment from Thomas about the religion question. The Germans practice a satru. Asatru, which Asatru. is a Nordic religion. And so that the, would they use runes, magic? Uh, Asatru and Vinyar are technically Nordic. Um, they use the all father Odin's knowledge and his brother's and his father's knowledge to basically make this um, religion, I guess you could say. It's also a way of life and they have like their own pantheon and stuff. So 
Um, it's pretty wholesome. <laughs> it's not all about going and raiding and pillaging. and da, da, da. That's a lot of propaganda most of the time. Uh, all is one. You need to go back to the very, very beginning of the video. Okay, so um, at this point, I'm going to let Apollomy have a little break here because I wanted to read something uh, from my from my book. Um, this relates to the altars off world. Um, the question is, actually, let me get this comment off. Sorry. Uh, let's get that. Sorry. Okay. And then uh, I don't get rid of that too. So um, do our altars off world have memories of us in the here and now? And the answer is apparently yes, but uh, they have treatment protocols for that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just, um, I think I've got about a page and a half. I'm not going to go spend too much time on this. Um, but uh, so this, uh, this, okay. So just sit back and relax while I go ahead and narrate this. Uh, <laughs> I've spent 20 years in HMS second class navigation manager, manager 6215 asset number in the German Nachwaffen Regier Dark Fleet NWR which could be compared to the Imperial Navy in Star Wars, but controlled by the Antarctic Germans. During this time, I was stationed on the Ethereon, a 20-mile-long wedge-shaped Aurora-class flagship. Ethereon's home port is located in Antarctica, as well as Base 285, an orbital space platform located above the northern latitude of polar Mars. Bertram S. looks similar to me, but he has longer hair. His uniform is dark blue with a hat, that has a gold emblem in the shape of the Luftwaffen fire wings. Bertram is aware of his altars, which includes me in the here and now, as I'm considered his home, home altar. He is scared of making contact due to being closely watched by a Draco liaison and handler stationed on the same bridge command deck which he serves in. If Bertram steps out of line, the Draco is under strict orders to report any changes of his behavior to Captain Zeiss. Zeiss is infected with black goo as required in order to hold that position in NWR, which would make him cold and inhuman. My Bertram altar does not appear to be infected with black goo. As an officer, I was entitled to my own quarters, which I think was located in level 19, room 326. I would spend a lot of time there finding access points and asteroid fields, making operational plans, deciding where ships needed to be, moving assets around, as well as making orders for roving patrols. Other officers I was stationed with have remarked how stale the air in my room was because I was in there so much, but I think I was in there because I wanted to hide from everybody because this place was so depressing. It was a basic room with nothing fancy inside, a bare Stein mug in the corner, some opt which was some Oktoberfest gift. There were no other personal items other than an NWR uniform hanging on the wall. My co co-worker and sometimes friend in the canteen area was Niles Freeman. I had a romantic interest with the ship mechanic Annette Bach. Annette Bach. My supervisor on night watch was Dietrich. He oversees navigation and reports to Zeiss directly about my activities and my shift. He notices when I eat and sleep, he is bigger built with curly hair. Bertram seems to be resisting his programming and on, and on hunger strike in order to recover some of his memories. On his last physical, they used a hammer on him to erase his recent memory recalls. In the ship's canteen area, the cafeteria, there are NWR personnel all around him eating. Bertram has a sandwich on his tray, grapefruit, and a glass of orange juice. He's not touching the grapefruit. Internal security is watching everyone's plate closely and taking notes of people who are not eating um, everything on the plate. One of them approaches Bertram, and he says something sounds like or something like that. I, I'm not. I have to go back to the recording for the, the regression, but they're upset at him for skipping his, eating the fruit. They are more concerned about personnel who are not, but they are more concerned about personnel who are not eating anything on their plate. Cause apparently that, uh, that, that does take place out there. Um, some people just lose the will to live and then they can just put you in the regen tank and re <laughs> regenerate you over and over. If you try to kill yourself, he is eventually allowed to have some vacation time on alpha Centauri three. This planet has a diameter of 11,940 miles and located approximately 37 million miles from Proximus Centauri. NWR has an embassy there. NWR personnel are not allowed to go more than a certain distance from the embassy before any being expelled. It's similar to how the Americans had to live near the U.S. embassy in the USSR. 
During this time, Corey Goods handler Gonzalez was stationed at that embassy, but was expelled after he was caught trying to spy on the defensive cap capabilities of the Galactic Federation. He was also barred from visiting Centauri 3 for the rest of his 3D life. During this time, Alter Bertram was in some type, was one of the shops in the recreational district and was quickly recalled, but was quickly recalled back to the Ophirian after the incident. Bertram touches a piece of Lemurian quartz crystal, which causes him to retrieve downloads of my life in the here and now. He looks around nervously to see if someone noticed. He kno knew that when he returns back to the ship, the Draco handler would ask what happened on the surface and would probably use the hammer on him again to keep him from remembering these new memories. The shopkeeper was a feline and was initially annoyed about Bertram's presence. Being that he's in the NWR, um, I guess you know the people on the planet weren't very friendly and weren't too happy with him. Knock off in there. When he notices that Bert Bertram is getting his memories back, he looks out the window to see if it's safe to interact and attempts to show him how to use the crystal. Bertram then sees visions of me in the here and now at my computer. He sees himself on Earth bowling wearing a striped sir sh shirt, then a trip to a fast food restaurant. He sees hometown in Newark, New Jersey, but these must be implanted memories or from another surrogate altar of mine as I never grew up there or lived there. He sees a skyscraper in, in New York City. There's a portal inside and it takes him to an underground dumb and to inner earth. This portal is only used by NWR officer class. However, regular crew members like himself can go through unguarded, un under guarded escort. He remembers being told that after 20 years of service, he will be paid $45,000 a year thereafter, on the, you know, after 20 years of service. Bertram then asks how he can defect to keep his memories. The liar and female informs him that he needs to compartmentalize his mind to hide his memories from the Draco that is monitoring him. When Bertram gets back to the Ethereum, he uses his memory bleed through of my life in the here and now to build a very crude meditation device using wireframe pyramids, which looks similar to the Neo Meditation Cube, which I have on my website. But security eventually found it and immediately took it away and tore up his quarters. Afterward, the Draco punished him and wiped his memories with the hammer. He was then directed to the canteen or bar beer house and given extra rations for alcohol in the hopes he would keep him from losing his psionic abilities. So I'm going to stop. That's all. That's all I got for that. But um, yeah. So uh, you, you want to comment? <laughs> Does that sound basically pretty much normal life out there? Kind of. <laughs> our our faction's a little different. I've noticed. Like it's not like full. Um full military like most people i guess i don't know it's <laughs> and that's the thing like like interacting with you and interacting with a couple of the other people who were like ssp like i i know that um section 13 exists and i know that i have a few friends who have actually been in section 13 with me um, but like we function on a completely different level than, than everybody else. Like, yes, we are soldiers and mer technically mercenaries and we do go out and get our orders and we are, you know, still within the, the U S um, projects and everything, but we don't have our ranking systems completely different. Our ranking system is based off of our abilities and how much damage that we can do by ourselves. And then they basically take that and whenever they need a, a group of us, usually we have an S class, you know, it goes from like, uh, I think it's like from D to A, S, and then you have M and E, you know, and then R because of your remote viewers as well, but so it's kind of like basically based off of those. <laughs> All right. Well, there's plenty more questions. You know, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because I'm I'm getting tired and um, I think it's, yeah, it's getting late here. But um, everybody, um, you, audience members, uh, most of you submitted great questions tonight for our guests and uh, for, my, for me. Um, we learned quite a bit. And, um, yeah, so again, Sierra, um, let me pull up your, so your website is, I mean, it's in the video description, galaxy of unity dot square space.com. Mm -hmm. so, uh, what, what can you tell us, uh, um, 
what's going on in this website here? So Galaxy of Unity is a new talk show that we, me and my crew started. Uh, we basically interview people of all sorts of stuff from like uh, ET abductions, uh, alien encounters, SSP, um, even if those people are like going out and doing legends like Nessie and Bigfoot. But it is also a place for me to do my 100% full disclosure. And it's definitely going to be long-winded. I am doing my best trying to get everything that I possibly can in chronological order <laughs> for my disclosure. And that's a lot of memories and a lot of time. Uh, we have our links on here. I have every single interview that I possibly could get on our website in order. And this one will eventually be on there too. Uh, we are just starting our fan page where people can donate music, pitch, uh, pictures, or anything like that to our website. And it's just a way to promote uh, people, but there is contracts to be signed, obviously. We do have merchandise that is starting to come out as well. And eventually, hopefully within next year, we will be starting our web series of Disclosure. But it's just kind of a little fun activity that me and my crew are doing. And then we also have our YouTube page, which we only put previews on because we do not censor our guests. They are allowed to fully speak their mind. Oh, yeah. And then we have Galactic Tea Time, which may actually start ending up being live. Uh, and it's just basically me inviting guests and just kind of chatting and speaking our mind about uh, topics at hand. And we also have every interview of ours on our podcast. So if you do not have time to fully watch everything, they are more than welcome to download the podcast. There's also a little bit of extra tidbit stuff on there from our crew. <laughs> And there's also an email address that people can contact you as well. Yeah, it's galaxyofunity at gmail.com. And that's for our entire crew, not just me. Great, great. Well, awesome. So audience members, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. I don't know how long this channel <laughs> lasts, but you can also be sure to go to Rumble as well. Um, are you, are you, you, you're also migrating over to other alternative platforms? Uh, so far, so far, we are on Twitter. Fa we have a Facebook group that you guys are more than welcome to join if you're on Facebook. Um, we're actually going to be doing a live event in celebration of our 200 subscribers to YouTube and our 100 subscribers on Facebook, and we'll be doing giveaway prizes. So <laughs> that'll be exciting. That's actually August 14th. So uh, if you want to join, please subscribe to YouTube or Facebook because only our subscribers can join in that special event. Excellent. So audience members, if you want to contact me, uh, info at supersoldertalk.com. There's also a contact form on supersoldertalk.com. Um, there's a donation page. Hmm. I could really use some donation or, I mean, of course, all, I guess, I you know, literally everything, everybody could use a little more money. I'm, <laughs> I'm producing a video. I just spent $200 <laughs> the last couple of days on this new video. So hmm. anything would help. Um, you can get my book uh, at uh, www.neologicaltech.com. Um, also, my meditation cubes are there too. Uh, so yeah, that looks like this. You put it on your lap and meditate with it. Um, so I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, but yeah, well, let's, you know, let's, um, maybe, maybe we'll bring you back on maybe another six months or a year from now. We'll, we'll come up, uh, I think with some more, when you, as you get more of your recall and we'll go from yeah. there, so everybody, may y'all have a great night and we'll all see you later. Any, any final comments? Have a good um, night. <laughs> okay. Well then there you have it. Have a great night <laughs> or daytime, wherever you may be. Because, uh, yeah, we're all over the place here in the, on this beautiful world, wherever you may be. Please consider supporting Super Soldier Talk by purchasing your own Neo Meditation device. Your Neo Meditation device will help you reduce stress, integrate trauma, 
enhance intuition, enhance clairvoyance, and enhance creativity. Get yours now at www.neologicaltech.com.